Muy buenos días y quiero darles las gracias al Instituto Interamericano para la Democracia por organizar este evento y quiero saludar a todos ustedes, los distinguidos invitados que están presentes hoy. Es un honor para mí estar aquí. Mi mandato es decir unas palabras sobre la e efectividad de la Carta Democracia Democrática Interamericana. Y lo siento, pero voy a cambiar idiomas y dar mi presentación en inglés porque quiero darles mis pensamientos y para mí es más fácil. So, has the Inter-American Democratic Charter been effective? More importantly, I believe it's been successful in advancing the cause of democracy. There's debate about how effective it's been in actually changing governments in Latin America and bringing them out more democracies. But I think more importantly, I believe the OAS has become a much more effective organization since the charter was signed. And I applaud the current leadership of Secretary General Almagro. But like many of the efforts of international organizations and international diplomacy for that matter, the jobs never finish, the mission is never done, the goal is to make progress, to make things better than they were before. And so no issue is ever as simple as we would hope it is. Governments and cultures face very complex issues that require complex responses, and they require time to actually implement real change. Quick and absolute solutions often come with negative consequences, and those consequences can sometimes actually make things worse than they were before. No one understands that better than many of you in this room, especially those of you who've been responsible for leading governments and running countries. So what I want to do is change the, the sort of change the tempo a little bit and talk about three simple things that I believe may help make the Inter-American Democratic Charter and the OAS and all of us, business or whatever you do, more successful in the future and more relevant today. So to help give it some context, I think we have to take a quick look at how our world has changed since the charter was signed. So think about it. 20 years ago, the Motorola Razor and the Blackberry were the most popular cell phones. Wi-Fi, as we know it today, was invented around 1999 it really started to take off around 2003. Today, more people own cell phones than toothbrushes. And over 90% of the Earth's population has access to a cell phone. The average time spent on a typical smartphone is about three hours a day. That's how the news gets out. That's how the world gets informed. And that's where the majority of the population goes for answers to their questions, questions about everything. And I would argue that the transformation from traditional media to a few lines on an internet site, a quick Google search, or a couple of minutes on a social media account is creating a lot of negative consequences that will have to play out over time. I'm talking about the challenges this poses to investigative journalism. I'm talking about accuracy versus the speed of information, about selective censorship, and yes, even fake news. So my first recommendation is this, adapt with the times to become a more relevant, a more relevant center for getting a message out in a quick, concise manner and in an attractive and easy to understand fashion. Think about it, some of your audience can't read and many of those who can won't read beyond the headline and the first line of bold print. My second recommendation is to consistently tell the truth in an unbiased manner. 
avoid lazy journalism. And as popular as the popular TV show Dragnet used to say, just the facts, ma'am. And as we used to say in the intelligence business, tell me what you know, not what you think. What we're seeing today in the media is the real story replaced by sensationalism. The truth replaced by the agenda for the day and the facts sacrificed for speed in order to be the first to get the story out. I think we also have to recognize that in politics, there's almost always an opposition and that opposition is actively pursuing their own agenda, sometimes spreading their own misinformation. So remaining unbiased requires discipline and hard work but it's important for credibility, which brings me to my third and final suggestion. We should automatically assume that our credibility is compromised and we must work to regain the trust and confidence of the people. Today, on a worldwide scale, we're witnessing a growing mistrust of government, of the various forms of government, especially democracies. Our law enforcement and the authority of our leadership is being questioned. And with this pandemic, even science is being questioned. I mean, think about it. When we were all told that masks were not necessary in the fight against COVID, only to be told minutes later that masks were mandatory in the fight against COVID. Think about when people argued that Trump's Operation Warp Speed couldn't possibly produce a safe vaccine for at least a decade only to say nine months later that the vaccines are available and now in some cases mandatory. All of this causes an erosion of public trust. And whether you're a medical doctor giving advice on COVID or the minister of finance, the public holds you and the, ministry and the administration you serve in responsible. We've even heard recent theories that people are simply against anything that their government is for. That kind of behavior creates chaos, like the chaos that shocked us all in Chile about two years ago, like the chaos we've seen this year in Colombia, and yes, like the chaos we've all witnessed across the United States over the past two years. And while that chaos hurts democratic governments, and often even the people that cause it, that chaos is celebrated by our enemies and by governments that would prefer to see us fail and democracy to die. So I'll recap very quickly and I'll stop here. Adapt and make better use of social media. Be unbiased and factual in the things you say and regain the trust and confidence of the people. Thank you very much.